Welcome and thank you for joining oh, that's us. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry I can't be with you in sunny Liverpool today. I bet it's uh, absolutely glorious where you are. Um, and again, I think, you know, just to emphasize um, your role as well in Birmingham, I think, you know, the way you led some of the transformation and integration is um, I've taken away some of that stuff as well. And it's inspired me to do things differently. Um, and not everyone has that kind of leadership from within an NHS organisation, you know, particularly from a commissioning point of view, we're going to talk a bit about that and how we can get bolder commissioning um, uh, at the heart of, uh, of our integrated care systems. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much to Tracy for the invite. Um, I really enjoyed your speech as well, Tracy. It was really brilliant to hear and really great to hear and quite kind of uplifting to get all the questions about community because that's, I think, that's very much the theme of my speech. Um, is about how do we really build a sense of community around a hospice within a place uh, that I think is the key to the success of, of our local places into the future. Um, so we'll move on to the to the first slide, if that's OK, please, Martin. Um, and I don't, I'm not here to show off about Wigan, um, you know, and if there's any colleagues here from um, Wigan and Lee Hospice, uh, I do apologise because you know, we're not perfect, we weren't perfect in Wigan, um, but it was a, a way of working and a set of ideas that might have some resonance with you and hopefully it will be useful for others into the future. Um, a big shout out to Lee Valance, the amazing Lee Valance, if she's here today from Bolton um, Hospice. She's absolutely another inspirational leader who I've learned a lot from, who's also on the board of our um, Foundation Trust at Bolton. So um, I don't want to be depressing about the next three years, but um, I just wanted to paint a very personal picture, perspective of what I think will happen in the next three years in order to help you prepare your strategy uh, within your localities. So I do think you know, it's cost a lot to pay for public services through COVID and we were already struggling. Public services were already at breaking point pre-pandemic. So I think we're going to get reduced funding and it might not be called austerity. And we've seen the Chancellor put lots more money into for example, local government and the NHS in the last budget. But if you compare it to what we did have back in 2011, it's a drop in the ocean, really. So, um, you know, it's going to take a while to build back the, the, the way that austerity has decimated public services and it's been made worse and brought into stark relief by the pandemic. We're going to see an increasing demand. Um, as Tracy said in her speech, the, the real crisis of loneliness, I think, is going to increase. You know, increasing disparity in, in income, in poverty. You know, when we look at our trust board in Bolton at, at where we get more admissions from, where we have poorer health outcomes, um, more stillborn babies, um, more people dying of COVID and lower vaccination uptake, it's in our poor communities um, and it's in our uh, black and minority ethnic communities. So we've got to have a more targeted response to the way that we uh, wrap services around people and provide them with more confidence and reassurance about how, how we can help them to live the best life that they can. I think we're going to get increased centralisation um, from the government. We've already seen it with the way that policy is being set in a very centralised way, um, which doesn't help the hospice movement, I think, because the hospice is by the very nature are local, they're rooted in communities, and I think you know we've really got to push for the local um, self-determination. I think we're going to see incoherent and overlapping strategy. So I think the only place that national strategy, because we live in a very centralised country, one of the most centralised in terms of policy in the whole world. So I think the only way it makes sense is by using the integrated care system to really drive through change um, and to really push the hospice movement forward. You know, people, um, some people have not been great from a CCG point of view of really understanding the power of a hospice. Some people have been amazing. Um, but so it's very mixed, a very mixed picture. So I think it's, it's kind of down to you a bit to push the role of a hospice within an ICS and within an integrated care partnership to show them what you can do, to really show how amazing you can be. Um, you know, it, and it's not just about the building, it's about different types of services, hospice at home. And other, I know the great work that you do. Um, I've been out and, and shadowed some of your staff and you are absolutely brilliant. And it's, you know, I take my hat off to you. Um, I think we're going to see ideology based policy. We've already seen it um, come to the fore. So that's not great, really. Um, uh, I don't think we can wait for a national plan for social care. Uh, it's just not there. Um, I've heard lots of people talk very fine words about it. And we've obviously got this bit of extra national insurance that 
is going to be coming to social care in three years time which is just i think it's going to have fallen over by then i'll be honest um i share i chair a social enterprise called possibilities for people with learning disability based in rochdale and we just cannot get staff we've never had an issue with, with turnover of staff we just cannot get them um i think we're going to see um a real kind of uh, brought into sharp relief again the fact that the pub current public service model the way that we run things based on silos of need from from the cabinet downwards is, is broken and the only way to reconstruct it is with communities in the locality and i think also now is the time to redefine the relationship between the citizen the council the hospice the nhs and between our staff and the council and the place in a relentless asset-based approach. Uh, there's never been a better time to be bold. You know, we've got to move from seeing people as passive patients, as, as passive recipients, um, you know, as, as, as customers, if you like, and move to a place where they are, where they are citizens and actors in determining their own care. We can move on to the next slide. So um, again, as I say, Wigan wasn't perfect, but it's, it's some good ideas there that you might want to use in your local area. And um, if you do want to know more about it, the King's Fund have written a really brilliant evaluation of it. It's called Lessons from the Wigan Deal from 2019. So it's a couple of years old, but they came to live with us for a year and they spoke to residents, they spoke to staff. They got a real feel for what was going on. It was a piece of anthropology. Really. Um, and they said that the, the single biggest thing that made a difference was, well, it's two things actually, clarity of purpose, what we were there to do. And then secondly, constancy of purpose, that we stuck with it. And we didn't keep chopping and changing our plans and having a, a, every week a new plan. It all fitted together in the place and it was a plan around the people, the communities and the place. So we knew that 50% of our activity in primary care in GP practices is socioeconomic, not clinical. Um, so it's around debt, domestic violence, loneliness, as Tracy said, worklessness and um, fuel poverty. 36% uh, of children in Wigan are not ready for school uh, at reception. So, and in some particular wards, it's 60% not ready for school at the age of four, which really holds them back throughout the rest of their life. So we really studied the work of Michael Marmot and tried to embed a Marmot uh, style approach to early intervention and prevention in the first 1,000 days of life. And I think it's a good asset test, um, acid test for ICSs to focus on the first 1,000 days of life and the last 1,000 days of life, which is where you come in and really make sure that every integrated care partnership has you know, really well uh, thought through pathways that are asset based, that are based on the person as a human being, not as a passive recipient of care. Um, and that is integrated and systemic and that everyone understands what their role is within that pathway. Uh, one in four of the children uh, in our primary school lives, lives in a house with a reportable incidence of domestic violence in the last two years. I found that quite shocking. 40% um, of residents at highest risk of unplanned hospital admission are adults of working age. So we, we often caricature people as kind of frail elderly, people who are at risk of an unplanned admission. Um, and when we risk stratified the population, we found that it was often people in their um, 30s, 40s and 50s with complex dependency on public services but we weren't working with a plan around the person or the family or the neighbourhood. We found in some cases there were there was one street for example in Wigan with 22 different social workers all working differently with different families on that one street. That is unsustainable. That is not a place-based approach to supporting communities to be the best that they can be, to avoid unplanned hospital admission, to avoid children going into social care and to focus on the strengths of that family um, and help them to be, again, the best that they can be. Um, so a huge amount of demand, uh, outstripping capacity across the sector, not just in primary care, but in acute care and in hospice care as well. Hospital sector completely overwhelmed um, with, with demand um, and an unsustainable model of both adults and children's social care focus on identifying individual needs and delivering interventions in a disjointed and disconnected way. Uh, we did an experiment with a woman called Hilary Cotton. I'm sure you've met her and been to some of her, her talk, TED Talks and, and, and read her book, Radical Help. It's worth a read if you haven't. Um, and it describes a new model of prevent, preventative relational working with citizens. And we did some work with Hilary with, with 25 families whose children were on the edge of being taken into social care. 
And what we found was we weren't using neighborhood networks. We were spending between a quarter of a million and half a million per year per family. And at the end of the year, they were in a worse position than at the beginning. 80% of our time was on assessment and referral rather than building a relationship and helping them and supporting them into training, employment, confidence building, helping them to come off drugs and alcohol um, and to find kind of hope in life. So we shifted that model and, and made that the way that we worked across a population of 323,000 people. So not as big as Birmingham, but, but still fairly big, ninth largest met. Um, home care provision was, is getting better, but still wasn't brilliant. We weren't using the hospice in a way that we, um, that we should be doing and very variable outcomes for health, the health and care system. And it was unaffordable, it was costing us a lot of money. So this was the deal, very simple um, and clear. And again, this is what the King's Fund commented on, that I think the average reading age um, in this country is, is eight years of age and strategies and policies are very complex and they're not easily relatable to. Um, and they overlap. And if you ask the average member of staff in a hospice, what's the hospice strategy? If they can't explain it back to you, then it's not a proper strategy. So all of our plans and strategies were on one page. They were very simple. And the deal is a relational model. It's about a relationship between the citizen and the state. So we froze council tax for 10 years. So we kept council tax as, um, at zero for 10 years. Um, and that meant an additional £500 per, fa per family per year in Band D property. And we felt that was a really positive way of supporting people through, um, through austerity, particularly when they were on a fixed in income. Um, we wanted people to support each other in the local place. We wanted to cut red tape in bureaucracy and shut down things that weren't working because we had lots of very expensive services, like day centres, for example, that just were not value for money and were not we're not delivering good outcomes for the people using them. So we worked differently with the community. We invested um, around 13 million altogether in 500 brand new projects that were there to build the social infrastructure rather than just build um, bigger hospitals and ask for more beds. It was about let's build the preventative infrastructure um, and spend money on, on that. Uh, let's not commission it top down. Let's ask local people what they think will work for them to improve their mental health, their physical activity, um, and to increase that social connection that Tracy talks about. I think it's the equivalent of um, smoking 15 cigarettes a day, isn't it, to be uh, socially isolated and lonely. So let's build those friendship groups in a local area. Um, and then there are things on the other side that we wanted people to do uh, as well to help us get through it. So if we can move on. So the very simple principles of the deal and um, different conversations, starting with um, what matters to you rather than what's the matter with you. And I know that's what the hospice movement really do strongly believe in. We wanted every public servant to know their local community. I think we've lost something a little bit um, along the way, really. We've kind of become disjointed and, and risk averse and very fractured in the way public services engage with local citizens. So we, we got people to go and do volunteering in the local community and I know we did Lots of people went to volunteer at the local hospice. Um, and, you know, we, we had every single member of staff was given um, a week to go and volunteer in the local community and they loved it. They formed connections with uh, local community groups and, and carried on doing it in their own time. 85% of the council staff lived in the local area. So it was a really strong way of building bonds between community and organisation. We set up seven integrated place-based teams that I think the ICS is very strongly encouraging people down that route. So if you haven't already done it within your locality, it's, I think it's important that people say that this does work. You know, 50 to th th sorry, 30 to 50,000 residents is seen as the average size of one of these place-based teams. But you've, you've basically got police, uh, GP practices, um, acute consultants, um, schools. Schools are really important parts of it. Primary care networks, health visitors, midwives, working together around the family with a plan for the family, um, having a, a key worker who is that link person, those individual families um, who need our help and, and really reaching out through community organisations to, to find out who they are and to help them in a more, rather than just waiting for them to come to a &E, um, going out there and coming up with a, a plan for them. We didn't call it social prescribing because that implies the power is with the GP, that the power in our case was with the citizen 
to ask for help and, and, and be able to get it on something called a community book that I'll talk about later. So a relentless asset-based approach, thinking of the strengths that everybody has um, and the things that they enjoy doing and trying to make that happen for them 365 days a year. And I know, again, that's something you as a movement believe in. Really focusing on the attitudes and behaviours of staff, re really flattening the hierarchies and empowering those frontline teams, giving them that permission to innovate and focusing on courage. So we, we, we would say to people, do anything that it takes to support that family to be the best they can be. Um, you know, we'll really back you. You've got that you've got that backing from leaders to try new things and again i think that's really important for ics's so that they're not hide bound by some of the system rules that we've just invented particularly within the nhs over the years that when you're actually trying to help someone they, they don't actually help if we can move on to the next one please so the how we deliver was really important we did something with an anthropologist called the big wigan experience which was um it was an immersive event over a half a day, which was hosted by frontline teams talking about what does it mean to be, to have a, uh, an asset-based conversation with somebody. Because um, some people might be very technically good at what they do, but they've not got that human connection. They really struggled to make those, to have that human to human conversation. And for us, it was really important that everyone who worked um, in the organization, in the NHS, in the police, in the Department of Work and Pensions, in our locality, had that approach, had that compassion, um, and had that deep listening, that ability that anthropology gives you to really walk in someone's shoes um, and not make judgments about people that are not based on what they've told you that they, that they want um, and the worries and concerns that they have. We can move on to the next one. So this is the community book. Oh, sorry, I'll uh, do this one first. So Sunshine House, just a little bit, just to exemplify how we managed to take the money out. Uh, so we saved over 180 million altogether in Wigan uh, by doing things differently. And this is how we did it. So we, we looked at what we already had, the assets that we already had in a, in a locality. And it could be a rundown community centre. It could be a, a closed swimming pool shut down many years ago because we couldn't afford to run it. It could be a rundown park. It could be a McDonald's. It could be a betting shop or a Greg's pasty shop. But these are assets in the place and we don't use them in the way that we could. We don't make the connections between them. Um, so through our integrated place-based teams, that's what we did. They're a source of community knowledge. Um, we found that the within Sunshine House, which was a run, in a run down, it's where George Orwell uh, lived when he brought the road to Wigan Pier, where he rented a, um, a, a part. It was run down then and it's still run down now. Um, but uh, there's some fantastic local people there, some fantastic local knowledge. Um, and it had real capacity to grow and to, to run itself. So um, this, the community investment fund I talked about, the 13 million, they secured some money from that, and, I think it was 160,000 they got. Um, we didn't micromanage it, because this is what happens very often, you'll know this, that you're given some money by um, an organisation and then they spend more than the money that they've given you on micromanaging you. Um, so we, we operated on the basis of trust. And we said, do work your magic with this money and do what you think is needed in the local community. And it worked wonders. We, we, we got so much more back by working in that way. We expanded community use. Um, we used social prescribing to reduce dependency, particularly around dependency on GP practices. And it was just unbelievable. Move on to the next one. Um, so doing the right thing also saves money. People think that, you know, all of this... Uh, it costs more money. Well, it may do initially, and you've got to kind of double run it for a while. Um, but just to give you a bit of an idea, this is a, Ella who's a real lady. That's not her real picture, but she is a real lady, 82 years old, uh, lives alone in sheltered accommodation, has a diagnosis of depression. So she's currently under the care of a psychiatric consultant. Um, she's having reablement from the council, followed by daycare, and referred to the integrated neighbourhood team. Well, how can we help Ella? So the total cost. Um, of Ella's care is around £4,256 a week. So we had a different conversation with Ella. Um, she's now actively involved in the community hub, doesn't want to go to the day centre, it was boring, um, reduced visits to the GP, she's got a friendship group in the community hub, no longer needs that mental health support um, because she has friends and social connection. And the total cost of that package is £1,301. So often I think people think you need a load of more money to just layer on top of the existing infrastructure. 
But I think we need to start to challenge the existing infrastructure and think, is it doing the right things? If we can move on, please. So example two is place-based integration in a place called Platte Bridge. Again, another area of um, high levels of deprivation. We don't call it deprivation. We call it social injustice. No one wants to be deprived. Um, and it's as a result of social injustice. So um, basically we brought together a multi-agency team as a, as a, to try something. And then we very quickly rolled it out. I think often what people do is they do pilots and then they never roll it out. So they just file it and it gets a, you know, file it on a dusty filing cabinet but we knew if something worked we were going to make it happen everywhere roll it out at scale and pace so we're there to bring public servants together to serve the public in a more connected way share knowledge and skills um, and work in the best interests of the people take a, a very common sense approach to helping people um, and to understand the value of every interaction so all of the organizations listed on the right hand side were part of that multi-agency team if we can move on, please, Martin. So we also did, this is Wigan, we also divided up um, the borough into these seven um, integrated neighbourhood teams. And we looked at what were the issues in those localities? Where did people live? We risk stratified the population, looked at who, who and where people lived who were more likely to come into hospital, whose children were more likely to not be ready for school at the age of four. So what, rather than wait for them to not be ready at the age of four, let's go and help them now from the day they're born, from even before they're born. Let's wrap support around those families in a more proactive way. Let's put primary heads in charge of that proactive approach to identifying those babies uh, before they're born in their patch and start to, because they're going to be the people who benefit from every child being ready for school at the age of four, the primary heads. We can move on. So um, I think just this is the final thing really from me. Thank you. Sorry, I've rabbited it on. Um, so the leadership bit for me, and I think this is where hospices can really help because, you know, you've got a real clear purpose. Um, but a lot of places don't have a single unifying philosophy, which is optimistic, simple and applies to the place and to everyone in the place. And that's that's where the beauty of an integrated care partnership can really come to life. Keep telling the story of place with illustrations every day to everyone with humility. Try to create a, a political and organisational support for a radical new model. If we carry on doing what we've always done, it's not going to work. <laughs> so we need to try something different. Um, and what's that? I can't remember who said it, but um, that old saying that if, you know, the, the definition of madness is to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. We've got to keep, we've got to try a different way. Um, build a strong and cohesive high energy team across the sectors. And again, hospices have got a really, you know, all the hospice leaders I've met are, are phenomenal people because you've had to work against the odds. So, you know, you will be a great addition to an ICS. Constantly listen harder to citizens and to our staff and to community groups. We can't do enough listening. Um, and I think sometimes the higher up you get in, a, in a, any organisation, the further away you are from the citizen. So making sure you have um, sessions that expose you to what's really going on within your organisation and within the community. Build a demand management strategy, not a budget strategy. Try to think some of those factors I talked about, you know, the, the quarter of a million, half a million pound family, that we're not, we're not tackling those issues in a connected way. So I think this is something for an ICS to explore. Build trust with staff and community and allow them to innovate and for it to be okay and to get your backing as leaders for it, to try new things. And finally, it's going to be a really tough winter. It's going to be a really tough three years ahead. So maintain your personal energy levels. And thank you very much for listening. Um, I think if you have any questions, we've got another slide that tells you how to post your questions on Slido. Thank you so much for listening um, and good luck to you all.